Let's look back at verse number 6 where the Bible read, And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment is come. And worship Him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. And there followed another angel saying, Babylon has fallen, has fallen that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image, and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever. And they have no rest day nor night who worship the beast and his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. And the title of my sermon this morning is Nine Terrors of Hell. Nine Terrors of Hell. Now we saw in verse number six, we have an angel flying. He's preaching the everlasting gospel. And what is he doing? He's trying to warn people of the judgment that is coming. Now we have a loving God. We have a God who is love, but he also has wrath. He also has judgment. And what's the purpose of preaching the gospel? To warn people how to flee from the wrath of God. And what is the wrath of God? Look at verse number 10. And they shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels, in the presence of the Lamb. The Bible describes hell as a place of fire and brimstone. You say, well, what is that? What is, what is brimstone? Well, if you just look in a modern dictionary or something like that, brimstone is sulfur. And if you study the Bible, brimstone is liquid fire. It's, just, it's fire that's so hot, it's liquid. Now, if you look at just the, uh, the last part of this phrase, though, it says, in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the lamb. Now, who's the lamb here? Is this talking about a literal lamb? Is it really just a, like a, a statue of a lamb in hell? No, it's talking about the Lord Jesus Christ, the lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. So some people would say, well, hell is just being separated from God. Maybe you've heard that before, right? They've said you, false prophets, false teachers, they try to soften hell, and they try to say, well, the reason why you don't want to go to hell is because you won't be near God. You won't be in his presence. You know, the atheist, he doesn't even, that doesn't scare him. He doesn't, even want to be, he doesn't even want to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, the sodomite reprobate, he hates God. He doesn't want to retain him in his knowledge. The fact that he could get away from God sounds pleasing to him. But guess what? You're not going to escape God. I don't care where you go. If you dig yourself down into hell, you can't escape his presence. But guess what? If you're in hell, you're in God's wrath. That's the type of presence you're in. And if you're in heaven, you're in the presence of his love. He's going to serve you is what the Bible even says. But we don't need to soften hell. Look, hell is not a good place to go. Hell is horrible. It's terrible. And there's nine terrors I'm going to prove this morning. Some people say, well, it's just separation. Or some people say, well, I think hell is this world. You know, maybe they have a bad life. Look, I don't care what's going on in your life. Hell, it, it doesn't even compare. And when we go through the scriptures and we look at the nine terrors of hell, if you think your life is hell, you're mistaken. They say, well, it's this earth. You know, you live in Phoenix and you go out soul winning, you're like, this is hell, man. It's like 120 degrees. Look, it gets a lot hotter where the Bible describes this place of hell. And you know, even the atheists today, they believe in a hell. If you go to the science class today, if you go to the college campus today, they will teach you that the center of this earth is full of magma, which is what? Liquid fire. They'll teach you that the inner and the outer core is a lot of liquid fire. Now, I looked up an article from the BBC. It says, humans have been all over the earth. We've conquered lands. We've flown through the air. We've dived in the deepest trenches in the ocean. We've been to the moon, if you believe that. It says, but... We've never been to the planet's core. We haven't even come close. He says nobody's been to the core. Nobody's even been kind of close, not even near it. He says the central point of the earth is estimated at 6,000 kilometers down. So no matter where you are on the surface of the earth, since we're on a sphere, 
today, this morning, right? We're on the circle of the earth, okay? If you go to the center, it's about six, over 6,000 kilometers deep. And you say, well, what's the biggest hole that somebody ever, you know, dug? Like, how far have we gotten? You know, like 5,000? Did we get real close? Look, the, the farthest pit or the farthest that we've ever drilled down is 12 kilometers. So the, to get to the center is 6,000. The furthest we've ever gotten is 12. That's 0.2%. That's not even 1% of getting down to the, the core. And when you get that far down, human tools and instruments and knowledge is just so, you know, we don't have, we're speculating. We, we can't get drill bits that long. We can't figure it out. Look, you're not going to dr dr drill all the way down to the core with man's power. In Wikipedia, it says that the Earth's inner core is primarily a solid ball with a radius of 1,200 kilometers. It says, or 760 miles. So according to Wikipedia, they believe that the core of the Earth is 760 miles in its diameter. It says the outer core, so there's an outer core. It says it's 18, or I'm sorry, it's 1,355 miles deep. And then they have what's called the mantle, which is another 1,800 miles. And then they say the crust of the earth is about three to 40 miles. So if you look at the earth, you have an inner core, and then you have an outer core, what's called a mantle, and then a thin layer of crust. We reside on this crust. Now the thing is, we've never gone past the crust. We don't even know what's beyond the crust. But you go to any science class, you look up any article online, they all agree there's fire underneath us. And they've never seen it. I mean, other than what's coming out of a volcano. Now, that's a pretty good indication that there's fire down there, right? But I'm just saying, they believe that. What is believing? It's when someone gives you a fact and you can't prove it and you just trust that it's true, right? So there's people today, everywhere on this whole planet, they all believe in a hell, a physical hell, but they don't believe in the hell of the Bible. They don't believe when Jesus Christ is describing a place of fire that's down below us. They didn't believe it. Well, go if you would to Isaiah chapter number 30. The Bible already proved that there was liquid fire. You would say, how, it, how could you look at this world today and just come up with the conclusion, you know, I, I think there's probably just liquid fire underneath us right now. I mean, that's kind of, you know, a strange hypothesis. Now, obviously, you've seen a volcano erupt. That gives you some kind of idea. But before any of science tried to confirm this or say this is true, look, the Bible already told us that there was liquid fire. Look at Isaiah 30, verse 33. For Tophet is ordained of old, yea, for the king it is prepared. He hath made it deep and large. The pile thereof is fire and much wood. The breath of the Lord, like a stream of brimstone, doth kindle it. Now he's talking about a physical location, but it's a symbol of hell. He's saying Tophet is a picture of hell. And he's saying God's breath is like is the stream of brimstone. His wrath coming out is like liquid fire. Go to Psalms chapter number 47. That's why you read in Revelation, what does it call hell? It says these are both cast alive into the lake of fire, burning with brimstone. Now, according to the Bible, death and hell will be cast into this lake of fire. But we see a place called the lake of fire. That sounds liquid to me, doesn't it? We see the fires moving, it's swirling. This is a horrible place. In Revelation 20, 10, it says, and the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. It says in Revelation 21, 8, but the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and, the, and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Look at Psalms 47. You say, this sounds like a horrible place. This sounds like a terrible place. You're right. Psalms 47, verse 2. For the Lord most high is terrible. He is a great king over all the earth. You know one of the attributes of God is that he's terrible. And you say, what does that mean? I thought terrible meant that someone's awful or bad or wicked. No, what the Bible's meaning here is that the Lord is of great terror. He is one to be feared. When you would see the Lord, terror, terror would strike into your hearts. If you had the thought of going to hell, that should strike fear into your hearts because the Lord is terrible. The Lord is one to be feared. 
Go to Psalms 90 now. Flip over just a couple more chapters. Go a couple more. Look, God's described as terrible many ways in the Bible, many times in the Bible. He's the one that we should have fear of. He's the one that created everything that we see today. And his wrath, there is nothing to compare unto the wrath of God. No matter what man can do to you, no matter what you could imagine, hell is worse. What God has developed as his wrath is the worst. Look at Psalms 90 verse 9. For all our days are passed away in thy wrath. We spend our years as a tale that is told. The days of our years are threescore years and ten. And if by reason of strength they be fourscore years. Yet is their strength labor and sorrow. For it is soon cut off and we fly away. Who knoweth the power of thine anger? Even according to thy fear, so is thy wrath. So teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. So now go to Matthew chapter 13. We'll start getting into my points. I wanted to give an introduction. Look, hell is a horrible place. It's a terrible place. We ought to fear the God who made it. We ought to fear the God of his wrath, the wrath and the judgment that is to come. Jesus said this in Matthew 10, fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body and hell. Jesus said, look, there is nothing on this earth that is anywhere close to you needing to fear compared to hell, compared to the wrath of God. What is my first terror? It's fire. If you haven't already picked that up from what I've been describing to you, hell is fire. There's fire. It's going to burn. There is heat. Look at Matthew 13, verse 38. The field is the world. The good seed are the children of the kingdom but the tares are the children of the wicked one. The enemy that sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world and the reapers are the angels. As therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be in the end of this world. So shall, uh, look at verse 50. And shall cast them into the furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. The Bible describes hell as a furnace, one that is burning with fire and heat. Flip over to Matthew 18 now. In Revelation 20, it says, And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. So what is hell? Hell is fire. Look at Matthew 18, verse 9. And if thy eye offend thee, pluck it out and cast it from thee. It is better for thee to enter into life with one eye rather than having two eyes to be cast into hell. Now, some people will be labeled as a fire and brimstone preacher. They would say, oh, you're just, you're just trying to scare people with hell. Yeah, I am. Yeah, you should fear the Lord. You should have the terror of hell. You should realize this is a real place. And you know who preached it more than anybody? Jesus Christ. You say, which prophet talked about hell the most? Jesus Christ. Don't listen to these liars that say, oh, Jesus is so loving. Oh, he just t- preached on love. Look, he warned about hell more than anybody else combined. Every Matthew, Mark, Luke, he's warning about hell over and over and over. He said it's so horrible, you would be better off just ripping your own eye out right now than going to hell. Can you imagine just getting a knife and gouging out your own eye right now? He says hell's way worse than that. You better even, you don't even know how bad hell is. He's warning. You know what? And burning pain, fire, it's the worst. I was looking up some information about what this would be like. It says thermal injury can be one of the most painful and disfiguring forms of trauma. It affects the skin, the largest and most visible organ. It says that most burn patients require anesthesia. I mean, anesthesia, you know, an an, an anesthetist, someone who performs anesthesia or gives anesthesia to people, a large portion of their clients are burn victims because they're in so much pain, they're in so much agony, they have to inject them with all kinds of drugs and all kinds of things just to get any kind of relief. There's no relief from just the pains of burning. They're not even on fire anymore and they're still suffering from it. Some descriptions of the pain, this is what people who have been burnt, they say this is what it feels like. They say tingling. They say they have stiffness. It's like a cold and a freezing. It's like cold and freezing and hot all at the same time. They say it's numbness. They say warmth. It's like pins and needles. It's like electric shock. 
It's like cramping. It's like itching. When you're on fire, it's pure panic. There is no rest. It says it consumes every thought. There is nothing, when you're on fire, you don't have any other thoughts. It's every single one of your thoughts at that moment. People are screaming bloody murder. Men that you think are strong, oh, some guy that's so big and strong, oh, I'm real tough. If he's on fire, he's gonna be screaming like a little girl. He's gonna be screaming bloody murder. There are some people that described, they said, burning is the pain has an unpleasant warmth to it, eating at my stomach, there's nausea too, just enough to make me hold onto the table for support, breath slow. I've often prized myself in ignoring praying and just rocking on regardless, but just, it isn't possible right now. It owns me, dominates every thought, controls every action. You can't even control your own body when you're on fire. You're just screaming and wailing. There's no control. Says another person says, pain sears through my abdomen better than a branding iron. My mind conceding to the torment, unable to bring a thought to completion. He can't even form a complete thought. He's in so much agony. His mind's racing. Says, without meaning to my body curls into something fetal, something primeval. And while the pain burns, it radiates. Go to Matthew chapter number 25. Look, this is a real thing. This is a real place. Jesus Christ is preaching this because it's real. That's why we go out and preach the gospel. That's why you try to get someone saved. Look, how could you want anybody to experience this? A family member, a friend, a mother, a father, a child, a grandparent, anyone, your spouse, yourself. Matthew 25, verse 41. Then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Now, do you think God loves the devil? When he made hell, he was thinking of Satan. How much hatred, how much wrath does the Lord have for the devil? And he's gonna send people there. Go to Revelation 14. It says in Mark 9, and if thy hand offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter into life maimed than having two hands to go into hell, into the fire that never shall be quenched. What's my second point? That hell's eternal. It's everlasting. Just as much as I would love to have everlasting life, you can have everlasting damnation in fire. Look at Revelation chapter 14, verse 11. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever. And they have no rest day nor night who worship the beast in his image and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. Now, the Jehovah's false witness or other false religions will say, well, you're just destroyed. This doesn't say you're destroyed. It's everlasting fire. You say, what's the fuel source? The people in there, the people that are in God's wrath, the presence of the Lamb. Go to Mark chapter number nine. It says in 2 Thessalonians chapter one, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. Again, the presence of the Lord. Look, to say that a separation from God, you just don't even know what the Bible says. It says you're in the presence of the Lord, but you're with his everlasting destruction. Look at Mark 9, this is again Jesus preaching. Look at verse 43. And if thy hand offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter into life maimed than having two hands to go into hell into the fire that never shall be quenched, where their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. And if thy foot offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter halt into life than having two feet and to be cast into hell. Into the fire that never shall be quenched, where their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. And if thy eye offend thee, pluck it out. It is better for thee to enter into the kingdom of God with one eye than having two eyes to be cast into hell fire, where their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. You say, well, I just think they're gonna be destroyed. Their worm dieth not. Well, I think the fire is gonna burn out. It's not gonna be quenched. It's gonna go on forever and ever and ever. Why? Because they did not obey the gospel. What does that mean? They didn't believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. They didn't accept his free gift of eternal life, so they get eternal damnation. They get eternal fire. God is a God of extremes here. God is one of love and of wrath. We ought to obey the gospel. Go to Matthew chapter number three, go backwards. 
It says in Matthew 25, and these shall go into everlasting punishment, but the righteous to life eternal. Do you want to suffer eternal damnation, eternal fire, eternal torment, or do you want to go into, with the righteous into life eternal? Matthew chapter 3, verse 5, then went out to him Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region about Jordan and were baptized of him in Jordan, confessing their sins. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, he said unto them, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bring forth, therefore, fruits meet for repentance. And think not to say within yourselves, We have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you, that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. And now also the axe is laid under the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree which bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. I indeed baptize you with water and repentance. But he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire, whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor and gather his wheat into his garner. But he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire the bible says that hell is forever one of the worst i think this is the worst thing the fact that it will never end and you say well they see the fire go to matthew chapter 22 not only is it fire not only is it going to last forever they're not even going to see it because the bible says that hell is outer darkness it says that it's complete darkness in second peter chapter 2 verse 4 it says for if god spared not the angels that sin but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment. Look at Matthew 22, verse 13. Then said the king to the servants, bind him hand and foot and take him away and cast him into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Go to Ecclesiastes chapter number 11, if you would. The Bible also said in Exodus chapter number 10, when it's describing the wrath of God that he poured out on Pharaoh and on the Egyptians, it said, and the Lord said unto Moses, stretch out thine hand toward heaven, that there may be darkness over the land of Egypt, even darkness which may be felt. The Bible says there is a darkness that can be felt. Imagine never seeing ever again. What a horrible thing. I mean, people today, they spend their whole life watching TV, don't they? Looking at images on the computer, looking at their Instagram looking at all kinds of photos and pictures and movies. They buy houses just to have a great view. They take all kinds of photos. They make photo albums. Look, vision is a great gift. Vision is a wonderful thing to be blessed with. The Bible says hell is darkness you will never see again. What a horrible feeling. What a feeling of complete misery. You don't know where you're going. You don't know what's around you. You can't see anything. You're in complete darkness. What does light do? It gives you information. It gives you knowledge. What does darkness do? It gives you fear. It gives you doubt. It gives you worry. It gives you uncertainty. You don't know what's going on. I don't like being in the dark. Hey, if I'm walking around my house and it's dark, I'm gonna keep running into things. I ran into the piano bench like two nights ago. It hurt. It's terrible. I'm trying to feel around. I'm like, I don't know where I'm going. Look, this is a horrible thing to be in complete darkness. Look at Ecclesiastes 11, verse 7. Truly the light is sweet and a pleasant thing it is for the eyes to behold the sun. The Bible says vision is great. I like being able to look at things. I like being able to look at the light. I like for things to light up. But you know what? They'll never get to experience that again. Some people, you know, they really like to sleep when it's dark. But guess what? Go to Luke chapter 16. There's no rest in hell. It's not a place to get cozy and take your nap. It's not a place to just, you know, go to sleep. Look, I like to be dark sometimes, and I go to sleep too. But you're not going to like this darkness. You're going to feel this darkness. There's so much uncertainty, you can feel the darkness. What's my fourth point? There's no rest, though. This is not a place of rest. Christ said, come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. If you enter into Christ's rest... If you enter into his salvation, it's rest. In Hebrews chapter 3, he said, So I swear in my wrath, they shall not enter into my rest. Revelation 14 says, And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest day nor night. So imagine you're running on a treadmill that's never ending. I mean, some people hate running, right? I mean, you, don't, you get really tired, you get really annoyed. Imagine it is never ending. 
I mean, you just keep going. You just keep going. You just, I just want to take a break. Now you just keep going. I, I just want to take a break. I just keep going. Never ending. I mean, just running on a treadmill. This is what I think about, you know, mothers when their kids don't get to take a nap. It's like no rest for the day, right? I mean, look, there's no rest in hell. Look at Luke chapter 16, verse 19. There was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuous every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus which was laid at his gate full of sores and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores and it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And in hell, he lift up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water, and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. And beside all this, between us and you there is a great goal fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot. Neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. Then he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou would ascend to him, my, to my father's house. For I have five brethren, that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. Abraham saith unto him, They have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. And he said unto them, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, Neither will he be persuaded the one rose from the dead. So now we have a long passage. And it's a parable. You would say, do you think this really happened? I think it's very possible that it happened, but it would have been a miracle because this guy actually saw Abraham. And we know that from the Bible it says that hell is a place of outer darkness. So this is not a common occurrence from my opinion, you know, of comparing Scripture with Scripture. But in this special miracle, we see a guy, he lifts up his highs, and all of a sudden he sees Father Abraham. And he's like, hey, you know, can you just give me a drink of water? Can I just get something? I'm tormented in this flame. And he says, look, you, were, you had comfort in this life, in the life of, of the world. He said, you receiveth thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. This guy has no rest. He can't get any relief. He can't even get a, just a drop of water on his tongue. Go to uh, Zechariah chapter 9. Keep your finger here in Luke chapter 16 because I want to keep referencing different points in this. Look, no relief. No rest. You think that you're weary now. You think that your boss pushes you now. You think you didn't get enough sleep last night. Look, you're not going to be getting any sleep when you're constantly on fire. You're not going to get any sleep when there's no rest day or night. You think, oh, it's dark. You're not going to be getting any rest. You're not going to be getting any relief. This guy's look up. I'm in torments. You know, give me any kind of relief. Give me any kind of comfort. None. He gets none. Look at Zechariah chapter 9, verse 11. As for thee also by the blood of thy covenant, I have sent forth thy prisoners out of the pit wherein is no water. No, not only is, do you have no rest, you're in constant torment. We see this guy, he's in torment. He wants any kind of relief. He wants just a drip of water. There's no water in that pit. Look, when there's everlasting fire, when you're engulfed in flames, there is no water. He can't get any relief. It's constant torment. You say, well, does it ever stop? No. Just you keep feeling agony after agony after agony after agony, and nobody on this earth can ever experience that because God put certain things in your body that stop this constant torment, like adrenaline, like shock. People that go through extreme traumatic experiences, they have things like adrenaline and shock that alleviate a lot of this pain. Have you ever been in, you know, in an accident or in so much pain? Where at the first, you don't feel anything. You're just kind of like all of a sudden, you know, you like kicked in high gear and you're like really alert and you're trying to work on the situation. And then all of a sudden when you're, it's calm and you're ready, now you start realizing you're in a lot of pain. I remember when I was younger, I was uh, staying with my sister in Springfield, and I was a pretty big skater, like just roller skates or whatever. So I had these inline skates. I'm going down this hill really fast. Well, there was kind of like this corner that I was going to round. I'm probably going, I don't know, very, very fast, maybe 15, 20 miles an hour, which on skates is pretty quick. And I'm rounding this corner, and a car comes out of nowhere. And, man, I just kind of tried to stop, but I just slid on the, the gravel just like for 
five feet or something like that. It just pretty much ripped all the skin off my leg. Like I'm just looking at my leg and just bleeding, like blood just going everywhere. But I didn't feel anything. I was just, I just kind of like popped up and I'm like, uh, I need to go back home. And the guy gave me a ride and I got back home and then I knocked on the door and I was like, you know, as soon as I knocked on the door, I'm safe. All of a sudden, like pain just everywhere in my body. But before then, I didn't feel anything. Why? Because the body has net natural protection to, you know, to help give you this type of relief called adrenaline. It's also called epinephrine. It's a hormone released by your adrenal glands and some neurons. The adrenal glands are located at the top of each kidney. They are responsible for producing many hormones, including adolestrone, cortisol, adrenaline, and no adrenaline. Adrenal glands are controlled by another gland called the pituitary gland. The adrenal glands are divided into two parts, outer glands and inner glands. The inner gland produces adrenaline. Adrenaline is also known as the fight or flight hormone. It is released in response to a stressful, exciting, dangerous, or threatening situation. Adrenaline helps your body react more quickly. It makes the heart beat faster, increases blood flow to the brain and muscles, and stimulates the body to make sugar to use for fuel. When adrenaline is released suddenly, it is often referred to as an adrenaline rush. So what is adrenaline? I mean, it's basically God built this extra mechanism in your body that when you have a heightened sense of awareness, like something's wrong, or I'm in danger, or there's something bad, certain hormones will be released in your body and you become like a super you. All of a sudden, you're a little bit stronger, you're a little bit faster, you can think clearer. I mean, you can just, you can react in a situation when it's dangerous. And not only that, it can protect you from whatever feelings of pain you have. Have you ever been in so much pain you can't like use your hand, or you can't use your leg, or you can't use your arm? The adrenaline will just overcome that. All of a sudden, hey, that doesn't matter what's going on with your leg, it could be half torn away, but you're gonna, the adrenaline's just gonna keep you going, right? And people do all kinds of crazy stuff. They lift cars, they do all kinds of things. God put this in your body to help you overcome intense pain. It even says an adrenaline rush is described as a boost of energy. It says rapid heart rate, sweating, heightened senses, rapid breathing, decreased ability to feel pain, increased strength and performance, dilated pupils, feeling jittery or nervous. After the stress or danger is gone, the effect of adrenaline can last up to one hour. So it's saying basically you get this one hour boost, now all of a sudden I can you know, react to certain situations. You know what happens in hell? No adrenaline, no shock. You don't have this God gift of adrenaline to just prevent all this torment. No, you're in constant torment. There's no relief. There's no adrenaline. There's no epinephrine. There's no shock. There's no anything. You're just constantly feeling the worst pain over and over and over and over. Never ends. Never ends. Look at Luke chapter number 13. Go to Luke chapter 13. It says there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. They're in so much agony. They're in so much pain. They just are biting their mouth to pieces. They can't even, they can't even do anything else. It says, but the children of the kingdom shall be cast into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth because they're in constant torment, constant pain, no relief. Look at Luke chapter 13, verse 28. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth when ye shall see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, and you yourselves thrust out. So he's saying in the great white throne judgment, when everybody's there and he sees all the great prophets that they thought were their prophet, they thought they were of Abraham, they thought they were of Isaac, they thought they were of Jacob, and then they're cast into outer darkness. They're cast into the lake of fire. They're judged according to their works. You know what they're gonna have? A lot of regret. They're gonna have a lot of of regret for the way that they lived their life not believing the gospel, not believing on the Lord Jesus Christ, not believing the true God, the God of the Bible. Go back to Luke chapter 16 where I had you just a few chapters forward. It says in verse 27, then he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou wouldest send him to my father's house. For I have five brethren that he may testify unto them lest they also come into this place of torment. Look, this guy, he says, not only did I screw up my life, you know how else's life I screwed up? All my brethren. I'm gonna suffer for all of eternity, but because I didn't believe the gospel, 
because I didn't get saved, because I didn't preach my brethren the gospel, they're going to come here too. And they're going to experience this pain and torment forever and ever. Please, even though it's too late for me, just save my brethren. He says, look, if they won't believe the Bible, it doesn't matter if Lazarus comes back from the dead. You know what? Lazarus did come back from the dead, a different Lazarus, and they still didn't believe him. He's like, let's put him to death too. Let's kill him because people might start believing in Jesus and go to heaven and escape the torments of hell. What a bunch of wicked, evil, false prophets. Go to Revelation chapter 9. Revelation chapter number 9. So what have you looked at? It's fire. It's eternal. It's darkness. There's no rest. You're in constant torment and you're going to be filled with regrets for yourself and for your family and for every person that's in hell with you. Not only that, it's a bottomless pit. Look at Revelation chapter 9, verse number 1. And the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth, and to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. And he opened the bottomless pit, and there arose a smoke out of the pit, as the smoke of a great furnace. And the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. Now, a lot of people, they have the fear of heights. They have a fear of of falling, the Bible describes hell as a bottomless pit, falling forever and ever and ever. That, that feeling you like on the roller coaster, it's not going to end. And you're not going to like the fact that it doesn't end, because guess what? You don't even know where you're going. You can't even see. You just constantly have this, this gut, this feeling in your gut that's just riching at you. You don't know what's happening. You're constantly falling in this bottomless pit. How horrible. It even says that when the judge or the dead are judged, they ascend out of the bottomless pit, meaning what? It's down below us. And if you imagine, look, there's nothing in the center. <laughs> How is gravity affecting? They're just constantly falling. They're in constant torment and flames. They have no idea what's happening. Go, if you would, to Matthew 26. Not only is it constant regret, not only is it a bottomless pit, the Bible says that going to hell is worse than non-existence. You would rather have not even existed. It says in Matthew 23, verse 14, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you devour how widows' houses, and for pretense make long prayer. Therefore, you shall receive the greater damnation. He's saying, woe unto you guys. What's headed for you in the future is horrible. Look at Matthew 26, verse 24. The Son of Man goeth as is written of him, but woe unto that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed, it had been good for that man if he had not been born. Look, Judas Iscariot, he wishes he had never even been born. Why? Because hell is so awful. It's such a horrible existence. It's so much misery and pain. I don't care what pleasures you had in this life. I don't care if you had all the money and all, you know, the lust of the flesh and every desire was satisfied and you enjoyed every single meal which, you know, if you ate at McDonald's, you already didn't enjoy every single meal, you know. You didn't, in, look, it's nothing to compare to having eternal punishment in hell. Go to Daniel chapter number nine. We'll look at my last point. He said, ye serpents, ye generation of vipers, how can you escape the damnation of hell? Saying, look, some people are going to this place. They've already sealed their fate. It's a worse fate than having never been born. Here's my last point. Daniel chapter 12, verse number one. And at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people, and there shall be a time of trouble, such as never was since there was a nation, even to that same time. And at that time thy people shall be delivered, every one that shall be found written in the book. And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall wake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. What's my last point? Shame. The people that are in hell are not only going to be hating the fact that they're being tortured, they're going to feel bad about it too. They're going to feel a lot of shame and ridicule and guilt for the mockery of the fact that they're in hell. Look, some people, you know, like the Benny Hens and the Kenneth Copelands and the Joel Osteens, these guys that are praised as these great men of God, what shame that they're going to be burning in the lowest parts of hell because they keep damning people to hell by teaching false gospels, by perverting the, the true God. 
by teaching all kinds of wickedness, they're going to be burning the lowest parts of hell. Murderers are going to be way above those guys. You know, adulterers and all these other people. Look, these false prophets, they have the greater damnation because they're damning souls. They're damning people to hell. Look, there's not anything I could do to someone physically that compares to anything to hell, any part of hell. I can't hurt somebody anywhere close to hell. Look, God is a terrible God. God is the one that we should be fearing, not man, not any person, not some apartment manager. Hey, you're not allowed to preach the gospel here. Hey, what are you doing? Look, these people are gonna burn in hell. Do you not care? Do you not believe the Bible? Do you not even believe the science class? Look, there's no rest. There's constant torment. You know, I don't care if these people come to my church, but I don't want them to go to hell. I don't want them to be in this constant torment, having all this shame. Go to Revelation chapter 20. And look, when I thought about this, even though everlasting is the worst, the shame is going to be really bad. Because the Bible says in the great white throne judgment, you're going to be judged according to your works. So imagine you getting up in front of just our church this morning and we just start reading your laundry list of your sins. How would you like that? How would that make you feel? How would you like your mom and your dad to be read every single one of your sins? You know, the Bible says the thought of foolishness is sin. Oh, you mean all those thoughts I had? All those thoughts are gonna be presented before me? What shame, what horribleness to have everybody sit there and, and get to hear all of your wicked filth. They're gonna find out what kind of filthy rags you really have. Oh, you think you're righteous? Let's list out all your sins, buddy. Let's see how you did according to the book. Let's see how your thoughts lined up with God's word. And they're gonna have so much shame and so much guilt. That's gonna be wicked. That's gonna be horrible for them. It's gonna be terrible. Look at uh, what I had you look at verse 12. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it. And death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged every man according to their works. That's horrible. I don't want to be judged by my... I don't want anybody to know. I just go to the Lord in prayer and, you know, try to ask for mercy and long-suffering and ask, beg for forgiveness. Look, I'm a wicked, vile sinner that needs to be saved by grace. And praise the Lord that my sins will not be mentioned to me. They're separated as far as the east is from the west. But for the damned, they're going to be judged according to their works. They're going to be have this laundry list. Hey, let's see what you really did. Let's see what you're really like. All those things you did in secret, all those things you did when you didn't think anybody was looking from your whole life, man, that's going to get big real quick, isn't it? Go, if you would, to uh, Psalms chapter 119. So what have we learned so far? We've learned the nine terrors I had of hell. And look, there's more. Like, I didn't cover everything about hell. I'm just giving you nine things that terrified me, that give me all kinds of worry about hell. It's fire. I mean, there's so much flame. I, I can't even imagine what it would be like to be burning alive, let alone for all of eternity. Second point is for, it's forever. There's darkness. You don't even get to see the fire. You just feel it. There's no rest. They're in constant torment. They're filled with regret. It's worse than having ever been born. They're in like a bottomless pit, and they will be filled with shame, shame and guilt. Look at Psalms 119, verse 104. Through thy precepts I get understanding. Therefore I hate every false way. How do you know so much about hell? Through God's word, what he told me. Not because of science class. Not because of my own personal opinion. Not because I think people deserve this. Not because of anything of, me, of myself. But through God's word, I learn what hell is like. And I believe the Bible this morning. I'm trying to get you to believe the Bible. Do you really believe this place exists? Do you really believe the God of the universe made this place? It uh, should affect your habits. It should affect your mentality. Why? He hates every false way. Look, you ought to hate people that pervert the gospel. You ought to hate the false prophets. You ought to hate all these churches in this complex that are damning people and sending them to hell every morning. 
sending all kinds of people to this place of eternal fire and damnation. Look, because of God's word, I hate these people. Why? Because they're just ruining people's lives for all of eternity. Look at verse 128. Therefore I esteem all thy precepts concerning all things to be right, and I hate every false way. This church is going to constantly preach against all the false religions, all the false prophets. Why? Because of hell. Because of the reality of hell. I don't want anyone to go to hell for any reason. Look, that's not my desire. Go to Luke chapter number 11. And everything that God said is right. You know, and as, as unfathomable as hell is, we ought not decide just because it's so bad. Because it's literally the worst thing imaginable that the Bible's not true. Because just because it, just because it's the worst thing imaginable doesn't mean it's not true. Look, that's the God of the Bible. That's the one that we worship and we serve in this church. That's the God that's written in these pages. The same one that says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believed in him should not perish but have everlasting life, is the same God that's describing the hell that we're reading this morning. I'm not giving you my opinion. I'm giving you what the Bible says. It says in Matthew 15, let them alone. They be blind leaders of the blind. And if the blind lead the blind, both shall fall in the ditch. You say, well, I think some of these guys, they're getting people saved. People are still going to heaven from these false prophets. Long. The blind leaders cannot lead anybody but to hell. They'll just cause people to go into the ditch, to go into the pit, to go into hell. They're not even saved. Look, they don't even know what they're teaching. Look at Luke chapter 11, verse 52. Woe unto you lawyers, for you have taken away the key of knowledge. Ye entered not in yourselves, and them that were entering in, ye hindered. You know what? If all these churches didn't exist right here, more people would probably just come to our church, wouldn't they? Like if there just wasn't another option, right? But all these false prophets, they're hindering people from going to heaven because they have a false version. They have a false option. Hey, come to my church. Come hear me preach a false gospel. That's why I get so angry when we go out soul winning and I hear someone say, hey, I don't want to take you away from a good church. What? This person's going to this church and they're not saved, and you think that's a good church? You think, hey, I don't want to take you from the Catholic church. I don't want to take you from this church that's damning your soul to hell. What? I don't want you to ever go to that church again. I say, if you don't come to my church, you know, at least don't go to that church. I say, you'd be better off never going to any of these churches, you know, than to not go. Look, go to my church. Go to a church that's, you know, preaching the gospel, right? Go to a church that believes the Bible, but don't, for, for sure as hell, don't go to one of these damn nation churches, one of these ones damning your soul, damning other souls. Look, God has his wrath on a church that's damning souls today. I don't want to be any part of it. I don't want to be anywhere near it. Go to Matthew 23. Say, why, why do you pick on these false prophets? Why do you name people by names? Because I don't want people to go to hell. Do you want people to go to hell? I wish that when I was growing up, I heard more people preaching against some of the pastors I liked. So I could be warned. So I could realize that they were a liar and a false prophet and damning people to hell. So that the family members in my life that are already dead, that I'm not able to give the gospel to, maybe I could have given the gospel to. Maybe I could have made sure that they were saved. You think I want my mom to be burning in hell this morning? Not at all. Not a part of me. You know what? I can't give her the gospel anymore, can I? I can't get, you have a family member, don't you? You have a friend. You can't give the gospel to anymore. Don't you wish maybe somebody had woken you up a little bit sooner? And you know what? The truth needs to wake some people up. God's word needs to get preached in this city so people get waked up and they can hear the gospel. They can believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and they can get saved. Look at Matthew 23, verse 15. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you compass sea and land to make one proselyte. And when he is made... You make them twofold more the child of hell than yourselves. What do these false prophets do? The only thing they do is damn people before they die. Making people, you know, a reprobate before they even are dead. They're already a child of hell. They're already a son of Belial. And look, there's more false prophets than we can count. There's more, you know, people preaching a damnable heresy than we can count. And look, we need to be the light. We need to be the ones going out and preaching the gospel. I have two more places I want you to turn this morning. Go to Psalms 126. Psalms 
if you believe hell is a terrible place, if you believe what I just showed you from the Bible, if you believe the Bible, if you're saved this morning, then here's my question. How can you go your whole life never giving one person the gospel? How could you say that you believe in this horrible place called hell and you never even try to save and warn one person? You don't even try to get... Look, how many Christians today have never tried to give anybody the gospel ever? Not even one time. Are you kidding me? Are you reading your Bible? Do you know about hell? How horrible it is? How terrible it is? I think we need some more hellfire and damnation preaching. Some more fire and brimstone preaching to wake people up, to warn them, to say, hey, do you believe your Bible this morning? The atheist believes there's a hell. Do you? Do you believe God's word? Look at Psalms 126, verse 6. He that goeth forth and weepeth, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. Look, I, I could have a tear in my, my eye this morning when I think about what I just said. When I think about the nine terrors of hell and somebody happening to go there, somebody that I know, so just even just an innocent person, just a normal, your average Joe, he wants to hear the gospel. He wants to get saved this morning. But he went to the Pentecostal church. And the Pentecostal church told him he can lose his salvation. He has to be perfect. He has to do all these works to be saved. Just trying to damn his soul. And if you don't go out there and preach him the gospel, if you don't go out and bear the precious seed, if you don't preach the word of God, how's he going to get saved? Who's going to warn him? Who's going to give him the gospel? And you're just going to let this guy go to hell. You say, oh man, my life's hard. Is it as hard as hell? Is it as hard as anything we read here? Oh man, going out and preaching the gospel for one hour, it's just so difficult. It's just, it's just tough. Look, do you really believe the Bible this morning? Look, anything in your life pales in comparison. Pales in any, any agony or pain or discomfort or suffering we have in this life. It can't even come close to hell. And if you have a mouth this morning and you have, you're saved, you have the ability to give the gospel. You have the ability to go out and preach the word of God, give somebody a chance to escape the dangers of hell. And you know what? We ought to be sincere. Look, I sincerely believe hell exists. That makes me want to be real sincere when I'm giving the gospel. Not want to make shortcuts either just to come back to the soul winning leader and say, oh, I got five. Oh, I got six. I want to make sure this person's not going to hell. I want to make sure this person believes right. I want to make sure that what I said makes sense, that I'm an effective soul winner, that I know what I'm saying. Look, I hate it when people get real defensive about the gospel. Oh, why'd you give me some kind of correction? Look, it's people's souls. It's people's eternity. We ought to never, you know, be uh, resistant to someone trying to help us give the gospel better. Even if it's not true. Even if you don't agree. You should take it with love and patience and be like, thank you. Thank you for trying to help me. Thank you. Thank you for checking this person, making sure they're still on their way to he he heaven. Because I didn't want them to go to hell. If you, wanted them, if you get offended by someone checking to make sure the person you just gave the gospel is really saved, you have, your heart's in the wrong place. Because your heart should be, I want this person to go to heaven. I don't want them to go to hell. Go to Jude chapter number one. The Bible says, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. And he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. Look, every person in this world that does not believe in the Lord Jesus Christ has God's wrath on them right now, and if they were to die, they will split hell wide open. That should motivate us to want to go out and preach the gospel, to get people saved. When you look at a person, when I walk in a busy area, when I walk in the uh, mall or I walk in Walmart, I just think all these people are damned. I don't see a bunch of saved Christians. I don't see a bunch of people going to heaven. It worries me. It makes me feel for this city. You know what? Maybe God just keeps flooding the city saying, hey, look, you need to turn back to me. He's bringing a hurricane. We need to be the light and say, hey, God, we'll, pre we'll preserve this city. We'll be the salt of the earth. We'll go out and give the gospel. Spare us. Spare this city. Let us be the light. Let us wake people up. Let us bring our sheaves in with us so we can get more people saved. Look at Jude chapter 1, verse 22. 
and some have compassion making a difference. If you never give the gospel, you have no compassion. You have no love. If you don't preach the gospel to anybody, you have no love in your heart today. You have no compassion. I'm not saying you're not going to heaven. This is just by faith. We just received the free gift. You know what? You can't say you're a loving person. You can't say you have any compassion. Because virtually every single person outside of this building is on their way to hell. And you can't even say, hey, can I show you how to go to heaven? And there's so many people that'll say, yes, please, show me. Thank you. It's not even like they're, they're not going to get really mad at you. Like that happens like one out of a thousand that somebody gets really mad at you. And you know what? It doesn't affect me at all. I don't I just move on. Okay. I'll show the guy that really wants to know. The guy that's really interested. And look, it's not because I want that guy to go to hell. But look, we need to go out and try to have, make a difference. Look at verse 23. Others saved with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. And I've had a family member accuse me, oh, and y'all go soul winning, you're trying to scare people into heaven. Yeah, I am. Yeah, yeah, it's a terrible place. Yeah, we have a terrible God. We ought to go out and preach, hey, if you don't believe in Jesus Christ, you're going to hell. You know what? I don't walk up to them screaming. <laughs> I'm not preaching at them like I would this morning, okay? I'm trying to you know, speak the truth in love. You know what? It's unloving not to warn someone they're on the way to hell. It's unloving not to try and show them how to escape the dangers of hell. And the Bible even says, look, some people, they save with fear. I'd rather be the guy that saved thousands with fear than be the guy that loved, no, loved everybody to hell. Oh, I'm so loving. I, look at my lifestyle evangelism. Look at how clean a life I live. Hey, if you didn't really believe in Jesus Christ, we'll figure out how clean a life you live. We'll figure out what you really were like, won't we? You know what? And you don't have to preach the gospel to anybody to be saved, right? How can you say you have love in your heart? How can you say you have any compassion in your heart? That's why I preach so many times a week. That's why I say, hey, if none of those times work, come see me. I'll help you go preach the gospel. It's that important. Yes, it is. Why? Because hell is real this morning. Hell is a terrible place. I don't want anyone to go there. And we ought to not, as a church, want anyone to go to hell. That's why we're going to constantly go out and preach the gospel. Oh, is that going to build our church? Is that going to just bring the droves in? No. Because people, after you get them saved, they're like, oh, I'm coming to your church. <laughs> I'm going to be there. You'll see me. Never see them. But you know what? At least I won't see them in hell. At least I'll see them in heaven. And you know what? We have a soul winning time. Two o'clock today. We have a soul winning time on Saturday. We have a soul winning time on Wednesday. If you've never been soul winning... My encouragement, just pick a time, go so winning once a week for one hour. Can you do that? Can you at least just, I mean, we just learned about hell. You can't even just go so winning once a week for one hour and preach the gospel. Save somebody, pull them out of the fire. If you really believe in the fire this morning, we ought to, we ought to uh, be terrified of the God of the Bible. Let's close in prayer. Thank you, Father, so much for your word. Thank you for giving us warning giving us instruction, and giving us your precepts so we could know of your judgment, we could know of your wrath, and that you've given us just the free gift to escape that wrath, that anybody who believes on your, your son would never have to enter into this horrible, terrible place of hell. But I pray that we wouldn't be so selfish to save ourselves, but we'd also look at our fellow brethren, we'd look at the fellow world that we live in, and decide it's more important for me to pull people out of the fire than to just watch TV, than to satisfy the lust of my flesh, than to desire, you know, just do whatever I want, but rather I could have some compassion, I could have some love in my heart, and go out and preach the everlasting gospel. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.